Um, Beck, for someone who's sort of got education in their DNA, um, where did that come from for you? Mm. Um, I don't know if it, I always say that teachers are born, uh, not made. It's always been in me. Uh, from an early age, I was always teaching my younger brother or younger cousins, taught them swimming, you know, and it was just a natural progression for me. Mm -hmm. uh, even in my career now where I'm at, I'm still educating. Uh, I see it as a core essential of life. Is it educators in the family? Is that a, is that a fam? Because often educators, it's a family thing. Yeah, 100%. Nope. No, dad is a hairdresser and a jack of all trades. Dad's a hairdresser. Yeah. That's the yeah. coolest thing I've heard on the podcast well, so he, far. Well, he used to be a uh, pastry chef. Right. Yeah, he's had some pretty cool jobs, yeah. my dad. Uh, and my mum is an incredible nurse. Yeah. You know, was um, in a country town. Uh, her and her twin worked at the same uh, hospital. Yeah. Uh, my mum was in the emergency department and my auntie was in the maternity ward. So. Was there ever a time in your life when nursing was an option? Absolutely not. No. No. Okay. No. Uh, my mum was incredible at it. Yep. Uh, look, I toyed with the idea for a little while, Westpac rescue helicopter, ambulance. Yeah. But uh, no, she was adamant that I needed to go find a different path. Mm -hmm. So. So how did it come about that education was going to be the thing for you? Was that a yeah. Was that known early? Um, look, no, it was, uh, I'm, I'm from Northern New South Wales in mm -hmm. the country, yep. uh, where, you know, the, the girls tended to go to the pharmacy or go into nursing or go into those types of things. And the boys went to, you know, the, the meatworks or yep. into other sort of building jobs and, and so on and so forth. And for me, I saw it was a natural progression from what I was doing anyway. Teaching made sense to me at that time. Mm -hmm. I started my degree in human movement science and education. So I was doing a double degree. Yeah. Um, and I loved it. Uh, and I was doing high school teaching. And part of that was that I had to do a primary school uh placement as well early yep. in the piece. Yep. And I found that when you walked into a primary school, you were a rock star and they loved you. And when I walked into high schools, they were taller than me. Yeah. Uh, so I tended to gravitate towards primary, primary. school, mm. but uh, more in the human movement science. So I was really in particular focused on um, health and physical health. And yeah. Because I teach um, at tertiary and mm -hmm. I have done for 10 plus years and I can't do secondary. Yeah. Um, because it's, the, I think it's the attitude. It's, it's a consistent, like just a mental battle with, mm. with most of those kids. The tertiary stuff's good because they've sort of decided to be there. I couldn't even imagine primary. I went to uni with a guy who finished the same degree as me. And then as soon as he finished his music degree, he went back and did a degree in primary teaching. And he's been primary teaching for the past 10 or 12 years. And he absolutely loves it. Yeah. This guy is not the guy you would picture to be like a primary one teacher. He's about six foot five, big guy deep voice, loudly yeah. spoken, but the gentle giant and the students absolutely love it. Best guy for primary school teaching. Yeah. yeah. Best. But yeah, primary was never anything that I think that I could do. And I think it's because I don't have children. I don't really understand children, but that's something that I wanted to ask you. Um, having had children in your life, does the way that you teach or your experience of teaching change once you've got your own kids? Yeah. It does? Yeah. And look, you still have I always talk about the fact that my students were always my kids. Yep. Um, I loved them like my kids. I cared for them like my kids. I spent, you know, six hours in the day with them mm -hmm. uh, for five days a week. Um, and you grow a, a wonderful bond with your students. But when you become a mother uh, or a parent, a father, uh, I don't know necessarily that your teaching practice changed, but I guess the way you approach things around maybe you had blind spots in um, expecting parents to come in or yep. be there all the time or um, uh, the, the workload at home, those types of things. So you're a little bit more cognizant of, of the child as a whole list of their whole environment rather yeah. than just their school environment. Because that's sort of the job of a teacher, particularly in primary, right? It's the duty of care that extends beyond mm. the classroom and, you know, what's the kid's home life like and, you know, is everything okay at home and what do I yep. need to do to, to be involved there? Um, tell us about how that career has gone for you then. So if you, what, what have you done? You've done stints in primary, yeah. but then you got more into education leadership, right? That was the thing for you is sort of deciding on the education. Yeah. yeah. So I, I landed uh, straight out of uni. I landed my dream job, primary school, uh, really small school in Newcastle, right on the beach, 
uh, was wonderful and I'd learnt so much about teaching there. Mm. Uh, there was a, a lot of challenges. I uh, My first year was in prep or kindergarten in New South Wales and I think that those teachers are worth their weight in gold. Mm. They are constantly on. Um because you're sort of a part-time babysitter, right? Well, there's no downtime, right? Mm. So we always talk about student-centered learning and and, and um, in, uh, enhancing student agency in the classroom. So giving the students a role in ownership of mm. their learning. In prep or kindergarten, it's slightly different in that yeah. you have to be on all the time, the entire time you're in the classroom, watching what's happening, ensuring that you're um, aware of everything that's going on, how you're pitching things, what each student is doing. Whereas students that are, you know, in the older years have a little bit more autonomy and teachers mm. can relax a little bit more and allow that freedom in the classroom to go. So yeah, yeah the kindy teachers are on. They're also teaching um the preps or the students and the parents, yeah. what it's like to be at school. To be at school. Yeah, yeah, so the expectations, setting, you know, the routines, all of those types of things, the behaviours, everything, they are the foundation mm. of the school because if it doesn't get set right. Yeah, can I interrupt you with a question there? Behaviour triggered a, a question for me because this is something that's become um, high on my radar in the last six months. I was diagnosed with ADHD mid last year. Mm. Um, and then when you all of a sudden look back with that lens, it becomes very clear that that was something that was present, particularly in your junior school years. Uh, is that something that, you know, that is stressful for a teacher, particularly in like kinder and prep? Is there a responsibility for you to be watching for these sorts of behavioral patterns and identify them? And, you know, because when I was a kid, it was just um, the report said he's always disruptive, can't concentrate, can't sit still, would be really good if he applied himself. Yeah. 12 years in a row and no one thought to check. Yeah, so I got those same comments in mine. Uh, gets distracted easily. Yeah, uh, would excel if applied. If, applied. if yep. I applied yep. myself. Um, look, yes, in a way, teachers are always uh, their job essentially, or our job, is enormous. Mm. It is to create a learning environment that supports all learning types, regardless of whether you have a diagnosis or not, yeah. or whether we can pinpoint a behavior into an area of a diagnosis or not. Teachers are not experts on, yeah. on these types of diagnoses. They are there to support the family and the school in making sure that that student achieves a level of success. Yeah. That's, that's what they're there for, mm. to help their students to succeed. Yeah. And so identifying certain behaviors that might be barriers um, no matter what sort of teaching method or, um, that you employ to support that student. Yes. It's, it's part of that duty of care to try and identify, um, anything that we can do to help that student, whether that is a diagnosis or whether that is some sort of intervention that we can do at school mm. or whether that is a change of a learning environment or a changing of a teaching method. So this, this, the teacher needs to work in partnership with the yep. parents and the leadership of the school to be able to support each and every one of our students. Feels like a ton of pressure, you know. When, when I, I'm here to actually teach, and here's all these other things that I need to be cognizant of and yeah. aware of, and stressful existence. Yeah, the pressure on teachers today to cover everything mm. and support everyone is enormous. Yeah, which is why we're seeing, you know, there was. Um, Eights will put out a, a initiative called, uh, it's called the Australian Teacher Workforce Data. Yeah. Uh, and some of it was really staggering. Some of the facts were really staggering. So uh, I think. And what we can do just if you get any of these facts and we'll put all of these links and yeah. things in the comments. So yeah, if there is anything that you're. For sure. Up, don't worry about that. Well, let me read them. So, right. um, so teachers working on an average of 150% capacity. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the data that they're pulling from the teachers. 42% of teachers reported working more than 60 hours a week. Then what is really scary is one in four have said that they're looking at leaving the profession. Yep. That's one in four teachers. If yep. you look at the number of teachers in your school, mm -hmm. there's 25 of them are looking at getting out. Yeah. Um, and 87% of those teachers have cited workload as yeah. the reason for wanting to leave. And I, 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 look, I can rela relate to that. Yep. I left the classroom in 2018 after a 16, 15 year career in the classroom. Yep. Um, and it is really hard and it is really stressful, but you love it. And yeah. I still miss the classroom. I still miss my kids. I still get to go back and see them. And I still somehow find little ways to insert myself into schools and classrooms with the teachers that I work with and the schools yeah. that I work with so that I can have those touch points. It's the thing about educating, I think. And I think that's one of the things where, 
you know, there's some people that get into a teaching profession and they use it as a profession. And then there's some people that get into teaching and they quickly realize that what they're responsible for is so much more than just educating someone. Mm. Um, and yeah, when you start forming those bonds, particularly, oh, wow. you know, and you've got those five or six champion students that you can just never get out of your head. Mm. Um, are there any of those people that, you know, that you hang on to in your mind that you know that, you know, it was, that was a, an awesome moment for me? Any of those yeah. Students that, yeah. I, oh, look, I have so many. So, uh, and from different perspectives, right? Mm. So my first three years of permanent teaching was in a tiny Catholic school, high socioeconomic, right on the beach. Yeah. Uh, I had my, the first year I was there, I had prep. The second year I was there, I had an across stage two, three class. So that's covering two different curriculums. Mm. Really tricky. I had a student in that class, uh, who was neurodivergent. Um, he had explosive outbursts, yep. uh, and really struggled, uh, to be in that social environment. It was a really big learning curve for me, but I was really excited to be able to support that student. Um, the wonderful thing about it was watching them succeed yeah. and seeing the things that I did that day work yeah. because the next day they might not have worked. Mm. You know, it changes constantly. Um, and I had to be agile in what I was doing and how I was supporting my student um, and all students in that classroom. That was something I had to be really cognizant of. You know, we, we, we were in that classroom uh, for a year, we developed within the first three weeks a safe word. Mm. So if I said the safe word, the students knew that they had to get out of their chairs, walk out of the classroom and go to our safe zone. And I had to put a lot of trust in my students and a lot of scaffolding around my expectations of their behaviour. And was that to manage any of the outbursts that might come from that other individual? Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, that student in particular had a safe space as well. So when I could see, because what you do as a teacher is you learn everything about that student. And so what I noticed about, um, what I noticed about him was that he had certain triggers, certain facial expressions that I knew it was getting too much yeah. or we were, we, it was all too much and he needed, a, he needed to break. So I would give him his safe word and he would go to his safe room and we filled it with so many things that he loved. Mm. Uh, and we, what I learned at that point was open communication. Yeah. Be curious always be curious. Yep. So I would ask him what it was like and he would explain it to me. It's like a storm in my head and I can't stop it. So what did we do to try and stop that storm or try and calm that storm? And, you know, he developed this room and built this room so that when he felt like that, he could go there. And, you know, by the end of term one, he was taking that initiative. Mm. We, he would say his special word to me, no questions asked, he would go. Yep. And then he would come back and he would feel centred and then we would talk about what led that led him to that point yeah. and how can we avoid that next time? That's so cool. It's so, and it's so cool that you've gone to that extent to manage that. And, you know, I, I also understand and appreciate the pressure that's on teachers, particularly when you've got one or two children that might need a bit of additional support. You know, back when I was at school, teaching assistants were unheard of. Like, you know, yeah. you, you, in, in order to get a teaching assistant, you would have to have someone with a severe physical disability. Yep. Um, you know, how are you, managing your own mental health when you know that here's a student that needs more of my attention, but there's 15 others that need the same amount of attention. How do mm. you manage that? Yeah. My own mental health. Yeah. Like when I you, didn't. When you're, no, I didn't at that stage, uh, you know, young teacher. Mm -hmm. I was early twenties. Uh, I think I, I can do everything. Yeah. hundred yep. percent. I was there from 7am to 7pm. That's not sustainable. Mm. It was for me. I had no family at home. You know, I loved my job. Yep. I wanted to be there. I actually got pulled in by my principal one day. And he told me a story that stuck with me for a really long time, uh, which is if you walked out of this school right now to go home, cross the road and got hit by a bus, I would be really sad. We would all be really sad. But next week I would have another teacher. But I tell you what, I, who can't replace you, other people at home, mm. those that love you, mm. your family, your, you know, your boyfriend, all of those. Yeah. And, and that, that stuck with me. I toned it down a little bit yep. when I was younger. Not a, not a lot. Because that was, that was my arc of learning. Mm. I learned about behavior management. I learned about teaching methods. I learned about best practice in supporting, you know, social, emotional well-being. Um, the learning never stopped though. So after those three years, I, I got the greatest mentor there uh, in education that anyone could have. And that's, you know, kudos to the New South Wales Department of Education. They, part of that. Always one of the leaders. A hundred percent. Always. 
they um to be able to teach in New South Wales, you, you know, you need to you need to be able to have uh, a well. Back then, as a starting teacher, I had to have a mentor mm. uh, and I had to do a lot of work with this mentor. Uh, and uh, he was fantastic. He taught me how to find the joy. Mm. It is a job. Yeah. Find the joy. Find yeah. the fun. Find, you know, if it's boring for you and it's boring for them and they're not going to learn it. And and that was quintessential for me because I can't learn anything if I'm bored, if I'm sitting there watching a screen yeah. or watching you read something or tell me something. I have to be involved and engaged in it and passionate about it for me to really learn and and retain that information. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I went from that school to a school in Blacktown in Sydney. Yeah. And so I went from 240 students total in the school to, uh, I think it was over 800 students. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was a shock. Yeah. Was that your first appointment out of like country town? Is this, is well, this the move to the city sort of Yeah, thing? well, sort of. So I was uh, Newcastle, mm. so small, small city, yep. I guess. Yep. Um, but Silver yeah. Chair. Yeah, silver chair, hundred <laughs> percent. Yep. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I guess it was. It was a big shock. There yeah. were so many kids and so many teachers, um, and that was a really interesting school because it was, um, again, rich in learning experiences for me. Low socioeconomic. A lot of students that were refugees. Um, we were eighty-five percent ESL. Yep. So a lot of, most of our For students. folks at home, ESL is. English as a second language. Yep, cool. So they spoke a different language at home mm -hmm. and uh, English was, was their secondary language that they spoke at school most likely. Yep. Um, my year two class had 60 boys and 30 girls. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, there, there was a lot of socioeconomic issues that we were addressing with, you know, inequalities, um, certain home lives that, you know, uh, weren't happy places. Yeah. Essentially. Um, and so managing my cl our classes, so we broke them up and, and, and this is, this is just, a, um, a probably an oversimplification simplification of it. Mm. But we broke the classes up into um, behavioural peaks. So yeah. we knew we had five or six students that were going to really need a lot of focus on behaviour management mm. um, and they went into individual classes. So we, we tried to keep them separate. Uh, we tried to balance the classes, if that makes sense. Mm. And so what happened was I was with a really wonderful teaching team at that point. So four women teachers, they were fantastic and inspirational and I learned so much with them. Uh, and we decided that our core subjects we would teach in our own classrooms, English, maths. Um, uh, and so our other KLAs, we actually broke up into inquiry-based learning. And this was back in 2008. Mm. Yeah, 2008 or even 2007 actually is when we first started. And so each teacher would take, we would break this, the classes up. So we would take the boys and we would have two solid boy classes and two mixed classes. And what we did was we put really good um, mentor boys with with boys that probably needed that grounding and yeah. that, that example, right? Um, and then we had mixed classes. And I, as the teacher, taught PE for the entire term. Yeah. So I got to change that lesson according to the group that I was doing. You know, I got to really, we, we had different behavior management systems for different groups, which was wonderful. We're really trying to be experimental in how we were delivering the curriculum to these students. Because when your home life is not great, mm. coming to school and expecting my students to sit down and listen and, and pay attention and learn is the last thing from their mind. Yeah. So I needed to create a safe space for my students. I also needed to find an avenue to be able to connect with my students. And that's big in teaching. How do I connect with my kids? Mm. And how do I connect them to the content? And how do I connect them to each other? Uh, and we were always searching for the best ways to do that. Uh, and that's where my love of tech came in. Yeah, because that's another thing that's been very prominent in, in your life. I, mm. I saw something about a master's in cybersecurity. Yeah, like, yeah. And we'll come to that. But mm. yeah, like where does the, where the intersection in technology begin? Yeah. Well, it started in 2003 when I came out of uni and was the youngest person on staff yep. and was dubbed the unofficial tech person, yep. mainly because I was the youngest on staff, but also mostly because I knew how to work the height of technology back then, which was 
the Motorola flip phone. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in a country town, I suppose that puts you even further up the scale because most tech is, you know, a little bit later to the party there. Yeah, well, look, the height of technology back then was uh, in the classroom was an overhead projector. So, uh, or, or one laptop that was connected to one little projector that went up onto yeah. a white screen. Now, and I guess. Three hours of use of the internet per yeah. day, everyone. Like, we've got a dedicated class just for the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, no. And look, my competitive side, I didn't want to let the computer win. I had to figure it out. I love puzzles. So, yeah. if something wasn't working, they would call me and uh, I would go and try and fix it because it just frustrated me. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I started there uh, in 2003 when I first came out and then uh, it really, I saw the impact that it had on me mm. and my students uh, when I went to Sydney. Yep. Um, and the Diocese of Parramatta were, were front runners and, and still are. So have you always been in Catholic? No. 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 So I've taught in independent and public as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. diocese, yeah, yeah, always the best. Yeah, so I was, I was, uh, I was supported quite well, and I had teachers coming in, like from from the diocese, coming into my classroom to have a look at what we were doing. So I started, I, I had my first board and technology, and I taught with um, a notebook, I guess, at that stage. Yep. So two thousand and three, that's when it was rolled out into my classroom mm -hmm. the first time. So I'd always taught with notebook, and I'd learned how to build these journeys, right? Someone like me, I like a journey, but I end up deviating and yep. we go down routes that find, you know, we find inquisitive, we stay curious and we, we find it out. So in year two, we could be talking about, you know, continents and oceans. And I have this wonderful lesson on continents and oceans, but somehow we end up talking about tectonic plates and yep. looking at the ring of fire because that's super interesting. And that's how my students Mm. retain this information because yeah. they go home and they talk about, did you know that there was a ring of fire? Yeah, so and cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's like that spark of curiosity and then, well, why were you talking about that? Well, we were talking about continents and oceans. Yeah. How many continents are there? And that's sort of how we... And that reinforces the educating at home, doesn't it? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's all about curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, yeah, so I saw the impact. My students, I had to have another teacher in my classroom. I didn't have a teacher's aid. Mm. Uh, I needed support. And so what I used to do was record myself doing oh, yeah. these lessons. Yeah. It was really cool. Uh, she, they, they gave her a name um, and she would, Mrs. Mrs. W, um, and she would do all the mundane things, mm. you know, the spelling lessons, the, the spelling list, the homework. She'd mark things. She'd call students out, you know, oh, that's great, Hayden. Well done, Jack. Good job. You know, Sarah, that's mm. wonderful. And they'd love it because they would interact with her. So I would record her and she would do the first, you know, little bit in the morning uh, for the start on a Monday and, and same on the Friday. That's how we started spelling. Mm -hmm. I started in spelling and then it started to move into, well, how do I, how do I integrate this into every lesson? Because they love it. Not just me recording, but games and yeah. collaboration and how do I, how do I get them to work together on a particular activity? And so I was starting to get them to, we did this NASA lesson, it was so fun. Uh, we dressed up in our, it was an art lesson, to be honest, yeah. and, which stemmed into a writing lesson. I wanted them to write a story about an alien. So to get there, we dressed up in our NASA gear. We recorded this um, NASA communication from home base uh, and I had to have my cousin at that time who's who's all in uh, his wonderful um, script writer and oh, did, yeah. you yeah, know, yeah, videography yeah. and things like that, had to teach me how to take a video from YouTube and put it into my recording. Yeah. Right? So they walked in, the precipice of this lesson was they walked in, they sat down, they were invited to join NASA on this massive mission. Uh, and what had happened is NASA had sent a team to Mars to establish a, um, a community and see if we could live on Mars. But we've lost communication with them. We don't know where they are. That's cool it's as. <laughs> very cool, right? So then they were like, yeah, we're going to do it. And they yeah. were talking to the kids and so on and so forth. And the kids were in the chairs and then we did the rocket ship takeoff and it, the lights were off and it was very cool. And they were walking around this, this planet. Mm. And then this YouTube video came up and, and about Mars and we were taking them through this narrative and they were walking through uh, the, the Mars settlement 
looking at, you know, there was dark rooms and you could hear voices and things like that. And all of a sudden there was a loud screech in the video. And I went, look at that. What's in the window? And they all looked at the window. And then I said, quick, get back in the rocket ship. It's an alien. And they ran and they got yeah. in the rocket ship. They came back. And then we came back on the screen and they said, right, we need to debrief you. You can't speak to anyone because we need your un, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it has to be your opinion of what it is. I need you to create what it looked like. Yeah. And so they couldn't speak to each other. And on their desk, they had all of these art supplies. So we played music while they stood there and they, they created this artwork for 30 minutes around this wonderful alien that they had seen. Yeah. And, um, and then they had to write a description of that alien for their report. Mm. And it was the most vivid writing I had ever seen by a group of year two students. Yeah. Uh, and it was just a wonder if I had have just walked in and went, I want you to make me an alien and I want you to write a description about it and use, you know, all of these language adjectives and adverbs and, 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 and make sure that you, you know, you're really descriptive and, and show me, don't tell me. Um, I don't think I would have got the same result. No. And so that's. Because it's the, it's the telling of the story that then inspires the inspiration, right? Like you're in there and now I'm actually having physical reactions to this. It's yeah. driving my imagination. Well, it's not even the telling of the story. It's the, the involvement in the story yeah. or the involvement okay. in the learning. Yeah. They were part of it and they were collaborating and they were, they were experiencing it rather than sitting back and being passive learners, yeah. they were actively involved. And that's, that's always the goal, right? That's what it's about. Yeah. And that's, and look, I always go back to, to, to my point. Sorry, I go down rabbit warrens, but, um, that's where I saw tech mm. make an impact yep. because without that, it would have just been draw me an alien. Correct. So that, that's where I learned using the right tech in the right way actually impacts outcomes for my students and myself because mm. I loved it and I enjoyed it. And and it and lessened the load for me because I wasn't, you know, trying to get everybody to pay attention or yep. stay on task or because they were in, yeah, they were bought in. in. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right. So that is the second teaching appointment. Yeah. Yeah. And then when is the move into, you know, actually influencing mm. and, and, yeah. and changing education? Yeah. So that happened when I moved to Brisbane. Um, so if I take you back to 2003, mm -hmm. the digital strategy back then was, you know, Harriet in year three wants Ozobots and, yeah. uh, you know, Greg in year five wants Spheros and we would buy them and, and they would be wonderful for about 1% of the time in the classroom. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we would check a box, whether that was coding or mapping back yep. then was a lot of, a lot of it. And so they would go sit on the shelf for the rest of the time, uh, and collect dust. And then if they moved classrooms or left the school, those pieces of technology that we had invested in would then go to waste yeah. and sit there. So I went, I worked at a school in Queensland in a private school, was very fortunate that they had the funding and the the vision to be able to was support that this. Francis? No, no, Sheldon College yeah, actually. Right. Yeah. Cause I know I've got a relationship with Sheldon too, but go on. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah. So Murray James up there, unbelievable. Yeah. Vanessa Noonan, yeah. unbelievable. So I was fortunate enough to work with, uh, with them. And there we started talking about, well, hang on, if we're investing in tech, it needs to actually impact the outcomes for the teachers and the students. Mm. It can't just be for 1% of the time. It has to be across the curriculum and scale across the year levels. Yeah. It's a waste of money. And I, and I, and I, I love going into schools and seeing their setups. I get so disappointed walking into STEM rooms that are filled from floor to roof of all of these incredible gadgets and and um, technology and devices that only get used in that room. Mm, Why no aren't context. they out in the classroom? Yeah. yeah. So I, I want them in the classroom being used across everything. Every every piece of tech that you invest in should be able to be used in all curriculum areas yeah. with all year levels. Otherwise it's, it's not the right investment. Um, and so we actually did something called uh, the EdTech Capabilities Assessment uh, because we knew that we needed to develop a, a digital strategy that underpinned our pedagogical strategy. It had, the tech in the room had to impact the outcomes. It can't just be a glorified TV screen or a glorified babysitter if your yeah. students are on a device, right? Yeah. Um, 
Also, tech's not the only thing in the classroom that you need to have in there. There are manual manipulatives that you need to have that complement it all together. Mm. And so um, before we made any decisions, we did something called an EdTech Capabilities Assessment. And so that, the wonderful thing about that is that it took all of the stakeholders' opinions. It took stock of where we were at that point in time. So at that point in time, we are quite a hybrid school. Um, uh, teachers in higher year levels were using different technology to the teachers in, in primary and ELC. We had an ELC as well, or do have an ELC. Um, and so they did this survey, all the teachers, all of the execs, all of the leadership, all of the IT support team did this survey. And I would argue that hopefully as it evolves, parents and students get involved in mm. this as well, because yeah. if you're going to make decisions around technology, you need to have all stakeholders' opinions, including the students and the parents. That's really valuable. Um, and this report was wonderful. And I have since done this with a lot of schools and a lot of jurisdictions mm -hmm. um, in my current role. Uh, what it does is it spits out a report for the individual teacher, but also for the school itself. And it measures you against uh, 25 capabilities that are categorized in four quadrants, vision, uh, vision and and, and uh, goal setting, uh, you know, the tech specs that you've got or your networking, your infrastructure, what is it in your teaching and learning areas. And those 25 capabilities are all broken up into those quadrants. And so what it does is it measures uh, the teachers and anyone who does this survey's opinion on where they think they are at in that element. Mm. And so what it does then is it will spit out sort of a quadrant. And so this research has been created or this tool has been created based off the research of, you know, NACE and OECD um, and, and it's been filtrated down. So essentially what it's done is it's looked at, well, these are the successful schools around the globe that are doing really well. Um, let me take a step back. How much money do you think has been spent on education technology in the last 60 years? I'm going to say whatever it is, it's not enough. Um, I couldn't, I probably couldn't guess the number. 40 million. So it's it's over a hundred yeah. billion. Hundred billion mm, in the last sixty years. So we're talking about from the gooseneck projectors, yeah. from the calculators that were going to ruin our mathematic capabilities, yeah. to all the way up to AI, yeah. right? For the last sixty years, when do you, so the spendish has gone like that? How do you think the outcomes for the students have gone? Worse. It's plateaued. Uh, we have seen areas where the imp um, the impact of tech has actually negatively affected the outcomes for students. And why is that? Used is it wrong tech, lazy? wrong tech used in the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. So, for instance, um, I'm a big advocate for one to three devices in early years. Yeah. So, one device for three students. Oh, okay. Massive advocate for that. Yeah. So not the one-to-one -one approach. No way. You, the reason being is that it's so easy to fall into the device isolation realm. Sure. Yeah. Kids put their headphones on yeah. and then they zone in yep. to their device. And they're not learning valuable communication, no. interaction skills. The right tech used in the right way actually enhances yeah. the learning environment for them to practice and Give develop. Your mic a tiny bit closer. Yeah, develop perfect. those skills. So if I'm using a one to three, and they're interacting with the content that I'm driving from wherever I am mm. uh, and I'm pushing content to them and I'm asking them to do independent activities or group activities or so on and so forth. But they have to negotiate, communicate, yeah. problem solve, Far out. think creative and critically because I have an answer but you have an answer. So maybe we have to share and justify our ideas to actually get one cohesive answer that we can share. And you're saying that's most valuable in the junior years. I like it in... A, it depends. Uh, definitely in the junior years, yeah. prep to, to year three, year four. Yeah. I love doing that. Uh, there are certain circumstances where maybe you're doing an assessment or you're doing yeah. rotation but groups. It's just the government was so on about how amazing the one-to-one -one, you know, technology yeah. program is and every student gets a device. Yeah, all the research says we know more tech does not mean better outcomes. Yeah. The right tech used in the right way yep. does. Yep. Uh, and we see it day in, day out. And it is, it is, it's so simple when you see it. Mm. It's a light bulb moment. You go, you're right. And so many um, teachers fall into that trap of going, well, we don't have devices, so we can't do it. 
there are other ways. Get Make them share. I yeah. love watching them share. Even our senior students or our older primary school students having to share it to to come up with a cohesive answer or talk to each other. Mm. It forces them to to branch out rather than hone in. Yeah. And, uh, yes, I of uh, isolation is the worst thing that could. That's such a cool strategy and I've never thought of it that way mm. um, particularly because you would always think that, yeah, a student having full access to their own device means that they can receive and more information, but it's full isolation. Yeah, on your own. 100%. And look, you, we talk about the workload of the teachers. That means that, you you, you know, you have to manage all of those devices. Mm. You have to come up. And yes, it might be easier to push a, an app out on the device and get them to do it on the app. But how, you know, I love the little busy hum in the yep. classroom where they're talking yeah. and they're collaborating because they learn more from peer to peer mm. uh, or sharing their ideas and, and being actively involved rather than passively yeah. sitting there and consuming it. So then interesting to me is you're probably the most passionate person about education I've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with. When is it a decision to then leave educating directly and move into something a bit more corporate? How yeah. did that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so we did this survey. I saw the results from the survey. So sorry, I, I was talking about that and then I went down another path. That's fine. It's, it's your show, <laughs> wherever we want to go. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we did this survey. We know that more tech doesn't equal better outcomes. What we saw and what changed our, 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 our tact was that we actually, from this report, it gave us three areas of focus, three areas we were doing really well at mm. and to maintain. And three areas we needed to focus on that if we wanted to change or have the biggest impact on our outcomes for our teachers and our students, then those were the areas we needed to focus on. Yeah. And one of them, P PD, was always a focus, right? Um, we would give our teachers all of these wonderful devices and then go, have fun. Good luck. Good luck with yeah. it. Here's a little <laughs> bit of PD. Um, but um, it was also the way we made decisions on tech was really big and we had to reevaluate how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the evaluation of the tech in the classroom. So we all did the, we made the decision, we put it in, we did a little bit of PD and then off we went. Yeah. We never actually went back and had the teachers evaluate, well, is this tech actually impacting us? Is it just a substitution for what you're doing or is it actually redefining what you're doing in your classroom. Yeah. So um, those three areas were were things that we had to go back and reflect on. So when it comes to making a decision um, in tech, we started to look at, well, we needed data-driven decision-making. Mm. We needed to go back to our teaching practice. And that's the, this is the formula for success when making a decision. Start with teaching practice. Yeah. So you need to understand what your teaching practice is. What are your exit outcomes for your students? So you want them independent. You want them to, to be curious and creative, critical thinkers. Right. So what is the teaching methods that we need to employ to be able to get there? Mm -hmm. Is it enhancing student agency and student voice in my classroom? Is it, you know, creating a learning environment where it's student centered? Um, those types of things. So what is our teaching practice? Then what is the software that supports that teaching practice? Yep. And then and only then do we look at what is the hardware that removes the barriers and supports both the software and the teaching practice mm. and then wrap it up with effective PD and an adoption and implementation plan. Now I got goosebumps just hearing that. Like it's so, it's, it makes so much sense when you package it like that. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, so that was a really defining moment for mm. me. Uh, in the classroom, I saw how it affected my class, my teaching practice and my mental health and wellbeing, because mm. when I'm able to employ the likes of that sort of technology, um, it alleviated a lot of the workload for me. So a lot of things became autonomous or automated, yep. my apologies, yep. in my classroom. The marking of certain things became automatic. I was able to breeze from independent activities to whole class, to small group without having to do anything. Mm. by a touch of a button. I was using, I had my teaching methods and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. Part of our evaluation process. So I had a wonderful leader at that school called Louise Morris. Unbelievable pedagogical mind. Yep. Really knows her stuff. She was always looking at how we can improve our teaching practices. This one term we were focused on how our feedback was impacting the outcomes of our students in their writing. And that's how specific and granular we got. Yeah. 
So we started looking at uh, some of the John Hattie strategies. And so our task as a team was to take one of those strategies and do it in a writing lesson, but use the tech in one classroom and not the tech in the other classroom Mm -hmm. and evaluate the effectiveness of the tech in supporting that. So we went away, Anita was my teaching partner. In my classroom, we did the analog version. So I rolled the dice. I still had a little bit of tech. I rolled the digital dice and they had characters on one dice and settings on the other. So we were adding a little bit of chance and a little bit of gamification in there. So the students got a character and a setting and they had to go away and they had to write their sizzling start. And so for teachers, for those who are not teachers and don't know what that is, it's just the the intro hook of the, the narrative. Yep. So um, they had to write their their narrative or their sizzling start. So off they went, they wrote it in their books, they came back, they sat in a circle. We all gave feedback. So part of this was they had to get peer feedback and teacher feedback and take it all in and do a three rewrite, essentially. So we sat in a circle, they read their sizzling starts, all the students gave their peer feedback. I ran around with a marking pen, mark spelling, punctuation and gave them two points from the peer feedback that they needed to work on in their next rewrite. So I did that with everybody. And then the assessment is how well has that been included? And yeah, yeah, so so when they go back, have they taken that feedback on and improved their has their writing improved? Mm-hmm. And we had to do that three times. Now mine went over an afternoon and a morning, so we ran out of time by by the time we'd done the second rewrite. I had to take those books home, mark them, lucky me, overnight, yeah. give them back to them. The momentum had stalled, uh, and so you know their writing had improved but it wasn't exponentially. Yeah. There were still some things there. In Anita's classroom, we went in and we employed something called a shout it out. Um, so we had a smart board at the, that time and we were using something called Lumio and it had a shout it out and we put them in teams mm-hmm. and we gave them one device per team. So there was eight students in each team and they got one device, so one to eight. Yeah. And they were told to write a sizzling start and we did the same thing, rolled the dice, gave them a character and a setting for each group and the only instructions they were given were you need to write a sizzling start. That mm-hmm. was it. So we were trying to enhance student voice and enhance the feedback to improve student writing. So off they went and the first group sent up their their um, sentence as did the third, uh, the second and the third. And we went through as a group and gave feedback and I wrote around their, their answer um, their feedback. And the first group had a few punctuation issues and it was a simple sentence. So we yep. started talking about adjectives, you know, how did the elephant enter the, the library and how did he rip the, the pages off the book? The second group, their sentence wasn't cohesive. We could tell the character in the setting, but we couldn't really get uh, an understanding of what was going on. The third group, they used one word, flash. And I went, that's my favorite. Uh, and I said, but I read it, I read flash and they went, that's not how you read it. I said, well, that's how you wrote it. Mm. How would you write it if you wanted to make me read it the way you wanted to? And they said, oh, we put an exclamation mark. I was like, perfect. But you've, you've hooked me. Oh, sorry. You've intrigued me, but you haven't hooked me yet. I need more. So off they went and they went away. And this was the biggest part that told me the difference between what I was doing in the analog version and what I was doing in the digital version was that we came back in their second rewrite the first group had thump, thump, thump as their sentence starter. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't give them any feedback on onomatopoeia yeah. or anything like that, but they'd heard the third group's feedback. And together you could hear the conversation going, well, how's our character going to move? So they were starting to bounce ideas off each other. Well, he'll probably stomp. Oh, we should do stomp. And someone went, no, do thump, thump, thump because it's alliteration. Mm. And then someone went, what's alliteration? And then they explained to each other what it was. I barely spoke a word in that lesson other than to when they came and said, what's another word for small? We want a different word for small. I said, go to our word wall that we never use. I bet you could find another word for small there. And so by the time we'd gotten to the three rewrite, these seven and eight-year-olds in year two had written beautiful sizzling starts together. It took me 30 minutes and then off they went and they wrote their own version of their sizzling start with a different character in a different setting. That lesson was theirs. They owned it. Yeah. They decided how they were going to do it. So what you can see in, in a presentation that I do, sometimes I have photos of my, my students doing this, mm-hmm. is that they all did it differently. Yeah. So group one, they decided to write it down first and then type it out on the iPad and one person was going to type it out for them. The second group, I'll leave for a minute, the third group, they, they decided that they were going to split off 
come up with ideas, then come back together and try and merge those ideas together. That was great. The second group who took the longest, the one that wasn't cohesive, we knew that it was a character, we knew it was setting, but by the end of it, it was a really wonderful, cohesive, sizzling start. Mm. They all decided the way that they were going to do it, they were going to be equal. We were all going to type one word each. Oh, wow. Took forever. Yeah. But they loved it, yeah. right? And so eventually they worked out their method of, okay, well, my word that comes after your word has to make sense. We have to go somewhere with this sentence. Mm. And so there were things being learned in that lesson that I hadn't planned for, um, that I I wasn't prepared to actually teach them. They had yeah. learned it themselves because yeah. they owned that lesson. And I was able to capture all of that because of the way that they were delivering their messaging. It wasn't that everybody had a device. It wasn't that uh, they were, you know, it was an incredible teaching moment from me. I wasn't filling a bucket. We were filling it together. Yeah, it feels to me it's more about acknowledging where the teacher has to remove themselves from the teaching and allow the students to formulate the outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's about moving into the middle of the room, identifying point of learning need for your students and being in the learning rather than trying to fill the bucket from the front. Yeah. Um, and it's not about removing yourself because the teacher needs to be there. Yeah. Learning is ubiquitous. Our role as a teacher is to teach our students to find or scaffold, be curious yeah. and ask questions and challenge things. And that's our job. Yeah. So then, yeah, where, when does the switch occur? Yeah, because so, for someone that is so damn into education at the coal face, mm. you know, you have to sacrifice being in the classroom, right? In the yeah. way that you would. Yeah, you do. I, I, I loved, I loved the classroom, mm. but I felt like we had made such an impact in my classroom and in the classrooms of my peers, my colleagues, that I wanted to do more. Yep. And uh, Smart had actually heard what we were doing. At Sheldon, the EdTech capabilities assessment that we did is was something that they had created. Yeah. Um, free tool wasn't skinned, so we I didn't actually know it was smarts. Um, and so they came and they had a look at what our school was doing. Um, and they coincidentally had an education role where I could do what I was doing, working with teachers and jurisdictional leaders around pedagogical shifts where the digital strategy was actually underpinning the pedagogical strategy. Yeah. The money we were pushing into tech was actually impacting outcomes positively. Yeah. And uh, I took a leap. It was a scary leap out mm. of the classroom. I can imagine because you'd be so safe in that spot. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I, do you know what? I miss the teaching. Yeah. I don't miss the programming and I don't miss the reporting. And whilst, you know, um, we had a lot of support in doing that, uh, I miss the classroom yeah, aspect. That's why you get into it to start. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It's the kids. Mm. Um, but what I've since learned is intergenerational learning is so important from from six months babies right through to you know hundred and six year olds. Yeah, learning doesn't stop, and the impact that we can have or that I can have in my role is exponential yeah it just it, it, it the sky's the limit because i can help businesses teach them how they can teach their yeah. their own clients yeah. or their own workforce um and get those messaging across you know um how do we educate our higher education students i'm doing a degree at the moment i can tell you the difference between the units that i'm doing ones where it's just powerpoint and videos and the others where it is actually interactive and collaborative i'm learning way more in those environments so you know i can impact education everywhere mm. for everyone and that's why i made the jump yep still an educator yeah of course um, and I think no matter – once you've been an educator, you're always an educator, right? And it's yeah. it's that concept of it changes the way, particularly, you know, in, in management. So I'm in people management. Mm. I'm in tech for sure. But my role is really mentoring and guiding the futures of the people beneath me. And my educator mind is always looking at that. You know, it's always mm -hmm. pulling apart the engagement that I have in I could sit back and tell and instruct and that's easy for me or I can sit back and try and create that collaborative learning environment where then this individual is going to pursue the learning and I can sort of step back and guide. Yeah. Um, and I feel like once you educate and you see those outcomes, that's just how you apply things to everything, right? I agree. You know, leadership is serving. Mm. That's what good leadership is. And, and in a high performance view, anyone in any role can be a leader. Yeah. Uh, and so... 
Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. It's all about supporting and serving those that you are, are working with mm. uh, and managing as well uh, to be able to be their best selves and, and to be to have the confidence to grow and essentially replace you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, where does cybersecurity come into all this? Uh, I think I said at the top of the, the, the podcast, uh, curious, yeah. curiosity. So I'll just do another uh, degree. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I have that type of personality and characteristic, you know, yeah. when I was a teacher, I, I had a business on the side where I could have a creative outlet and so on and so forth. That was jewellery. It was jewellery. Yeah. It still is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's still happening too. Yeah. I just do it for friends and, yeah. and things like that. I, I, I love creating stories. Uh, storytelling is, yeah. is who I am. Yeah. Um, and I tell stories in many different ways. I've told a thousand stories today. Yeah. Um, but through creating jewellery also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sorry. Yeah. Cybersecurity. Yeah. So, um, so I was really curious. I wanted to see what was behind the curtain. You know, cybersecurity is always, I often refer to it as uh, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. 100%. You know, it's scary. We don't know because we we don't understand it mm. we haven't educated ourselves or or there is so much to learn mm. that it and it evolves so quickly and moves so quickly that you know you can't be an expert for very yeah. long no. um or an expert at all uh you can be a champion or you can be an advisor and so on and so forth but you're constantly learning and and, and evolving in your knowledge and your skill set and so I started, the reason I started was because I was really curious about what was behind the curtain. I wanted to take that fear away. I wanted to learn how it worked because mm. I love a puzzle. I want to know how to keep myself safe, how to keep my family safe, how to keep my friends and everyone else safe. And that's how it started. And then I realized that I was good at it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and how it applied to my work as well. So are the products that I'm putting in schools and advocating are they safe? And so, you know, you look at our teachers, they are gifted and talented individuals, but they're also bowerbirds. They will yeah. find amazing things in random places and use them. But what they're not realizing is that cross-platform usage with their students, they're creating data lakes on, yeah. on their students, which is being used for, you know, ad techs and other uh, for other reasons. And so how do I make sure that uh, our our products are safe and secure and, and are, are being um, conscious of data privacy and security. Mm. And so, yeah, it's sort of translated a little bit into work as well. But, um, but yeah, I really enjoy it. That's full on. It's, it's so left of field. But, you know, one of those things, but when you look at the type of personality that you are, it makes perfect sense. Um, so now you're at Smart. Mm. You've been there for... Three, six years six this year. Six years, is it? Far yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what's going on there because Smart is one of those organizations that through my career I've had multiple touch points yeah. with depending on you know what what I've been doing it's always been loosely either in education selling or education providing mm. omnipresent in that space um but you know a company that I guess you would think makes interactive whiteboards mm. but you you know you, you pull back the curtain on that and there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on behind the scenes 100 mm. percent so it had to be a big wonderful thing for me to leave a classroom for. Yeah. So at Smart Technologies, we don't see ourselves as a technology company, which sounds weird. Mm. Uh, we see ourselves as a connections company, a company about making, building or facilitating connections that matter. Yep. We build products that our users use to build connections that matter for themselves. Yep. So whether that's a student in a classroom connecting with the teacher, with their content, with their peers, or a resident in an aged care facility that's connecting with the, the other residents in the room, yeah, wow. uh, the diversional therapist or themselves, which is really important, their history, their past, their present, and more importantly, their future mm. um, and their purpose uh, or, you know, businesses that, that are wanting to connect better with each other, yeah. collaborate better with each other or, or their clients and so on and so forth. So, you know, smart technologies is more than just a, a smart TV. Yeah. They were the original creators of yeah. interactive flat, uh, um, flat panels or IWBs back then. That's right. Interactive whiteboard. Yeah. Blah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, my first one was in 2003. Yeah. The old projector based one. Yeah. Absolutely. That was going 15 years later. Yeah. Wow. That board. Yeah. I loved it. It, always, it had that uh, wonderful orientation game that everybody loved to play. Yeah. Yeah, the dot game. Yes. Yeah. So it's come a long way since then. Uh, and, 
you know, I, smart are, they're not just interested in putting units in classrooms or businesses or so on and so forth. They want to see the impact. Mm. How is the technology actually making an impact in that environment? And so at the moment we've got three really wonderful initiatives going on, mostly in education at the moment here in Australia but in um, enterprise globally. So uh, we're currently doing a research project with Melbourne Uni, Matt Harrison, Dr Matt Harrison. Yep incredible human, on how we can leverage technology to build or create a learning environment that is inclusive for students with neurodivergence. Awesome. Yeah. So. <laughs> Do you need a test subject? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can come and join us. I know a guy. Yeah. So yeah. it's, well, you know, we spoke about it at, at the start, you know, you felt disconnected. Mm. The report cards showed that yep. we weren't you know, we weren't being seen or being supported in the way we needed. How do we build a learning environment that supports all of our students or what we call universal design for learning, learning framework, my yeah. apologies, or yeah. UDL. Yeah. Um, so UDL is based on the premises of um, teaching methods and learning environments that take away the barriers for every student yeah. for them to succeed. And so how do we build that learning environment? What, what blueprint do we need? And it's not just tech. It is manipulatives. It's, you know, um, we're looking at ways how our smart board can integrate or our software can integrate with uh, this wonderful device that's actually in South Africa at the moment, um, being used a lot for students that are low vision or visually impaired. Yeah. And it has Braille and it not only tells them what's on the screen, but it also shows them the picture. Mm. Unbelievable. So how do we get those you know, the peripherals, the the front of room technology, the teacher devices, the hand, the on-desk manipulatives, you know, carpet boards are unbelievable for yeah. students that need that tactile yep. visual um, timetable. So how do we create this one learning environment that supports all learners? All learning types. Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. So we're doing that at the moment. Was that, was it, the name was Matt? Matt, Dr. Matt Harrison. Dr. Matt Harrison. Mm. Can you organise Dr. Matt Harrison to come on the show? Absolutely. Fantastic. He would love to. We're coming for you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. he's cool. a, he's oh, a content be, expert. I don't like great. to. Yeah, absolutely. Love he's that. fantastic. Awesome. Uh, and wonderful to listen to and m probably more passionate about education than myself. More. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know what I'm going to do on that day. All right, that, that, we'll, <laughs> we'll follow that up for sure. But, um, but yeah, so we, we're doing that. We're also doing a really – a project that's close to my heart. I've worked with a school in Adenda country in Northern Territory mm. uh, since I started at SMART. Yeah. They are doing wonderful things where they're trying to preserve language. And so, Indigenous language. Yes, yep. Adenda. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's happening and what's been interesting is my visits out there, I've learnt more about um, uh, that school. And so the students can speak Adenda. And they are learning how to speak, write, and read English. But they are also learning how to read and write Adenda yeah, as well because right. it's never been written down, right? Oh, right. Yeah. And so the other interesting thing about that is that the linguist that went out there to translate Adenda to English is actually German. So he used <laughs> German phonetics. So the way that they spell Ginger Porter Catholic School is actually spelt in German phonetics. Ah, really interesting. That's full on. Yeah, it's really cool, right? So at the moment, so we've been doing lots of work with them. They've got smart boards and they use our software and all of those sorts of things. And we 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 work towards how we support the learning out there with that, with the tech, right? Mm. Um, but this is the really important part. How do we preserve the culture and the language? What they've got is this wonderful resource room that's got 30 years worth of laminated. Uh, resources with Adenda and English. So for the students to to learn mm -hmm. how to read and write Adenda and, and, and what it means in English and so on and so forth. And so we're just embarking on a project where uh, we're working with the resource team out there, the elders um, and the, the cultural teachers out there to actually digitise all of that content and then make that available for every teacher. So that if there are other communities or other teachers out there who want to take out, say, Adenda language and put in Gadigal. Oh, of course. Because there's so many Indigenous dialects, right, and they're all very specific to the region that yeah. they're from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it goes back to the point of, well, teachers have to cover so much. And, yes, Aboriginal perspectives and preserving of culture 
is in the curriculum as well. It mm-hmm. is a very important part of the curriculum. But how do I teach? Our teachers are not neuroscientists yep. who 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 know that they're not cultural experts. You know, how do we support them? Mm. Well, we build digital rep- repositories that are curriculum aligned that they can go to and find content that they can use in their classroom, repurpose, so yeah. they don't have to recreate the wheel. So we're minimising the workload of our teachers and that's really important. Um, and so, so Smart is doing so much more than just selling displays. Right? Oh, yeah. It's, the, it's about how we educate and how we communicate and how we deliver. 100%. Mm. How do we connect? How yeah. do we connect people to culture, to history, to content, to education? Maybe I'm ignorant. I feel like, respectfully, Smart could probably do a better job at making noise around this because this is really important stuff. Do you know what? We are really good at doing lots of really good things. We are so bad at saying how good we are yeah. and all the good things that we're doing. I know, like, again, I understand that there's software elements to Smart and, and mm. all the things, but like this story isn't being told and, and I no. feel like it has to be. No, you're right. Um, and look, maybe it's because we're always so busy doing the things yep. rather than talking about the things. Mm-hmm. It's something that we do need to work on. It is it is a blind spot of ours. Uh, well, you've got a podcast now that's going to tell everyone all perfect. about it. So that starts it off. Beautiful. <laughs> perfect. Mm. But, uh, but no, I, I mean, look, it was really wonderful to be able to do those types of things and to be in a company that supports me in doing those things yeah. and not just me, my team. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, we get to drive – the destiny of our own business here. And, and that's really important to us. We, we never used to, we never used our marketing dollars to actually market ourselves, if yeah. that makes sense. It yep. was always to drive these initiatives. Uh, and it takes a special kind of company to actually support that. So, you know, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're impacting the outcomes of everybody that uses yeah. the tech. Yeah. And, and that's what's our, that's our why. Mm. Um, we've gone over an hour, which is perfectly fine. Sorry. No, no, don't apologize, please. I want to finish off with a couple of things though. So, mm. um, obviously what's next for smart, you know, mm. is there, is there things coming down the pike that if you're in education you want to be aware of, do we want to be connected to some major announcements that are coming? We've got ISE on at the moment. Yeah. I think you're headed overseas this afternoon. I am to, heading yeah. to Spain. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we do have a lot of brand new, so smart is in a, in um, a really good position, we are focused on R&D. So you can see the inclusive education is a focus of ours. Aged care is a focus of ours. So improving practice and supporting um, quality of life in aged care. Um, And so we, you know, we have products that we're developing and that we're partnering with and we're running a pilot here in Australia currently now. Uh, And the results are astounding, wonderful. Um, we have a brand new RX board that's coming out that has fantastic things where, um, you have stamps or manipulatives that can interact with the board. So really tactile things for those students that have, um, a functional supports, uh, functional support needs or EL, uh, sorry, ELC, so yep. early childhood. Yep. Um, and so there's lots of brand new things coming out. Lumio is now, um, you're able to collaboratively build lessons with our teachers. So the software that I keep talking about is Lumio. Um, it's a it's a browser based software that can interact with any student device. Yep. So essentially, we've always any product we develop is agnostic to mm. any device. We want to be able to fit into every environment. That's really important. Um, and so I can put my PDFs and my PowerPoints into Lumio. Um, and then take what is normally a very static piece of content yeah. and turn it into a really dynamic collaborative piece of learning for my students that yeah. I can push to their devices and they can collaborate on or work independently at home on. Um, and so there's lots of things coming to Lumio. Australian content is coming on our boards. Yeah. So, you know, handwriting lines. One really uh, exciting thing that we've been working on is uh, with Pat Caruso. Over at We Create, mm-hmm. Pat is an Aranda Italian man. Yeah, he he's um, his story stems from Aranda country, and that's how we connected. So I I wanted a piece of art that told our story here about connections that matter for Australia. I wanted to tell our story our way, mm-hmm. um, and Pat created this wonderful piece of artwork that talks about connections that matter. Uh, and we got to talking, and I spoke about this school, and he said, "Do you know that I'm from?" out in the country. I went, no way. And he goes, yeah, yeah. My mum was part of the stolen generation. Wow. Never been back. Wow, yeah. And I said, well, you know what? 
Let's go. Where's Pat from? Is he Melbourne? No, he lives in Adelaide. Uh, if he's ever in Melbourne. I will. I'll you. get him on here. I'll <laughs> get him on. I'll, I'll, be your re- I'll be your rep. They're uh, such good stories, Beck. <laughs> they are. Oh, well, uh, you know what? That's that's life. Correct. Uh, connecting with people, their that's stories. That's really what this show is about at the end of the day, right? Because there's so many people, in, even in our industry, like someone like you, I would have pegged you as the smart rep and yeah. that would have been it, you know, but everyone's got these amazing stories behind the scenes. And that's what 100%. really I'm about at this point is people that have got amazing stories to tell. Like, yeah. yeah. Tell the story. That's how we connect, right, mm. is sharing each other's stories. Yeah. Um, but that's also how brilliant ideas come about, right? I might have an inkling of an idea, but when I speak to you, then it becomes yeah. something that could impact the world in, in wondrous ways. And we never had home. books once, you know, and, and I think looking at the Indigenous community is probably the example that you can have that snapshot into how things used to be. Mm. Like everything was storytelling once. 100%. History was story to every, there was no writing. There was no, nowhere to put words down. No. It was all that communication. 100%. And look, I don't know if you knew instinctually that's where I was going, but no. so from, <laughs> <laughs> from, from Pat and I's connection, we said, well, you know, what, what, do, what do we, what can we do? What do we, what do we want to do? We want to be able to give every school and a, a way to embed Aboriginal perspectives or storytelling into every piece of, you know, every KLA across every year level, yeah. scaling across the curriculum. So Pat and I designed this interactive piece where it has, and we did it in Adanda, well, mostly it, it's Adanda symbols. Mm-hmm. Some of them are globally accepted as as um, as uh, the symbols that they use in different countries. So Pat's designed these wonderful um symbols and on the page and we took Pat and his mum out to Adanda Ginger Porter to launch this oh, yeah. with the school that inspired it. Yeah. Uh, and so on our smart boards you will have Dreamtime storytelling uh, capabilities. So the students were able to pull up different symbols to tell the story of their past and then we did a water cycle. So tell the story of the water cycle from Aboriginal dream times and then we, we used the Aboriginal symbols to tell the water cycle. Um, and then another one that his mum came up with, she's a brilliant woman, by the way, um, Dr. Jenny Caruso. Mm-hmm. If you ever get a minute on LinkedIn, look her up. Yep. Saltbush Consulting, incredible. She Her story is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I won't tell it. That's her story. Yep. But um, she was even suggesting, you know, you could talk about the, the evolution of technology. You talk about you know, how how Aboriginals used to communicate um, back in the dream time, but how do they use Facebook now? It's very yeah. different to how other communities use Facebook. Yeah. And so you could use this piece of um, uh, lesson or pa- it's a page sitting on our smart boards that you can use in every lesson yeah. to, to add those Aboriginal perspectives in there. And it was just, it was a wonderful lesson that, the students really loved and they got to go up and build it on the board and then they got to make artworks out of it. And the classroom teacher caught me as I was leaving. She said, they have not stopped peppering me to get them laminated and up on the wall. So good. And I was like, that's, that's the whole point. Yeah. They wanted to tell their story their way. I have to, I have to introduce you to a woman, um, Katie Randall, who was on the last episode of last year. Um, she, you guys would hit it off. She the cyber security. Correct. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, like I so listen much, to her podcast. So much in common. And, you know, she is very about um, empowering and returning to Indigenous cultures. Mm. It, her perspective when I um, had her on was really interesting to me because we sort of asked the question of now give me a snapshot of how you experience Australia and its engagement, support, connectedness to the Indigenous community and how is that? compared to New Zealand. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a whole different thing. Mm. And so her vision is really about bringing that same level of integration that she's grown up with, with with the native um, New Zealanders. She wants to do the same thing here. And so she's doing a business very similar, you know, all about IT, making it sustainable for community, sustainable for, um, you know, people to be able to educate the right way, a whole Mm. bunch of stuff. I think you guys really would hit it off beautifully. Yeah, Yeah. and I, I completely agree. Every time I go to New Zealand, Kiora, yep. you know, I, ha- I have to learn yep. how, how the language to be able to integrate. And you speak to the the teachers over there and the students or the teachers that have, uh, the students that have come up through it mm. that are now working in tech and they talk about, yeah, we, in primary school, I learned about my mountain, my, you know, my river. Um, for us, that was never something that we were, were taught. Yeah. And even like, there's even this subtext with, um, you know, with white New Zealanders that they don't even see themselves 
separate from the native Maoris anymore. Like their, their community has evolved to that point where it, they're all just New Zealanders now and mm. some of them are native and they've been there a bit longer, but the white ones that are there are also, and they're not different from the, mm. the Maoris. It's just, it's all one big community. Um, you know, if we can get to something like that, we'll be miles in front. Mm. But we keep doing this thing where it's, you know, Australia just has a different mentality, I think. And I don't know how to fix it, um, but there's still lengths to go. Yeah, 100%. Hundred percent. And look, the start would be to communicate. Yeah. Be curious. Yeah. Be listen you know, to the stories. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Share stories and 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 ask questions. Mm. So you know, and that's that's thankfully what I get to do for a living. Yeah. So wonderful. And then figure out how how I can make it better or enhance it with mm. the technology that I get to use. So off to Spain in a bit, couple hours. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Busy day. <laughs> yeah, I'm running late already yeah. as per usual, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, no, uh, heading to Spain tonight to, yep. to meet up with our, our global team. Really exciting. They're, um, they're focused on building connections outside, you know, for our clients, but also for our, our team. It's really important that they get us together. You know, I was over in Hong Kong in December with mm. my international team. So it's, uh, it's very often that we get together and it's very... you got to walk the talk, right? 100%, 100%. And yep. that's, you know... Um, this has been amazing. This has probably been, I can't say the best cause I'll offend all my other guests, but equally one of the greatest podcasts that oh. I've done. You're so passionate and I just love passionate people because I can sit back and just let you do your thing. It's been great. I want to do it again. Um, for anyone that wants to follow up with any of the information on today, um, yeah. we'll have links for everything, everyone reach out to Beck, Please. get some amazing advice. Um, Thank you. Have a story, <laughs> share yeah. a story. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for having me. I've uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah, and we'll do it again. Yep, sounds great. Have a safe uh, trip and, uh, and we'll see you when you get back. <laughs> Thanks. Have a wonderful Friday. Ta.